All right, so this is a video I would have liked to have seen someone else do. I've been looking for something like this so I could base mine off of it. And I wasn't able to locate anything, so hopefully this can inspire others to do the same. But what I'm talking about is adding a log lift to the super split log splitter. One small town New England family living out their adventures. One day at a time sharing for the whole world to see. This is Build A Lot Acres. Please remember to like and subscribe if you enjoyed today's video. So this is something I wish Super Split offered as a optional you know, upgrade, but there was a company called Split Second that was a kinetic splitter manufacturer and they actually offered a log lift that would fit in the super splits, but it was a manual lift, which had a big lever and you had to pull the lever to get the lift. The lift I'm gonna do is gonna be powered by an electric actuator and a battery. And it's gonna be much easier than trying to pull a big lever. And let's go over some of the components. So mine's gonna be powered by this electric actuator. That's gonna be powered by a battery, which will be sitting underneath on the beam. You know, I'm gonna add, I'm gonna weld on a square tube that's gonna mount brackets to hold that and have a battery tray. So I had to do quite a bit of calculations and do some test fitting with some wooden patterns to get the right lengths because they make different strokes for these, just like hydraulic pistons. So this is a 10 inch stroke. So from when it's fully retracted to fully extended, it's a 10 inch difference. So you need to kind of factor that in and figure out where your bracket's gonna weld on in order to get the table at the right height when you want it all the way up. So this is a heavy duty actuator. It's rated for 675 pounds, which I think will be plenty. I don't see me going over three or 400 on my rounds, but this table is also gonna be a nice staging table to put rounds on and smaller wood that I could pick up by hand, but it'll just give me somewhere to place it. So that's gonna be the main component. And then you have a reverse polarity switch. This is gonna allow the actuator to go both directions. And for me to control, I'm gonna to have to mount somewhere on the splitter, a bracket to hold the switch. I got my roll on brackets. These are heavy duty, three eighths thick. It doesn't come with brackets. And truthfully, I think they'd be too flimsy anyways. So on my own, we're heavy duty enough. I got my pins to hold on the brackets and then I got a couple of grease fittings that are gonna allow me to put grease onto the pivot axle, which is a three quarter inch rod. And then the main frame is just two by two, three sixteenths thick angle iron. And I've already done some of the fabrication in my house. I welded on these brackets. I cut my horizontal spaces for the lift arm. And you now that's gonna be the general idea so it'll make more sense as we get through and deeper into the video so stay tuned Essentially, all I did was transfer the distance from the point there to the center of the pivot pipe onto this actual piece of steel. Marked it, 
and then I want half of that 43 degrees on each side, which is 21 and a half degrees. We're gonna cut this out, heat up the other side, and bend it with the cutting torch.
Now, while the paint's drying, let's go over the project a little more and I'll give you some more details on different things. So the linear actuator is rated for 675 pounds. It's got a 10 inch stroke. So I actually chose this actuator for a couple of reasons. A, it looked really heavy duty compared to some of the ones I was looking at. And despite being a slightly more expensive, um, it also is about twice as fast as most of the ones I looked at. So they rate these in millimeters per second. So this is a 10 millimeter per second, whereas a lot of the ones I was looking at were five millimeters per second. So if you do the math, 10 inches of travel is about 254 millimeters. So that means it would take about 25 seconds for this to fully extend or retract, whereas the five millimeter per second is gonna take close to a minute. That might not seem like a lot of difference, but when you're waiting for the rounds to get lifted up, that extra 25 seconds is gonna add up quickly when you're doing it multiple times a day. So let's move on to the switch. So this is a non-momentary switch, meaning it's not spring-loaded. So when I press, it does not automatically return to neutral like a momentary switch does. Now you could use either style. I actually didn't even know what kind it was. I ordered it off of Amazon and this is what came in, but I actually prefer this because if I switch it on and then go and grab a piece or do something, as soon as it gets fully extended, the actuator, it's automatically gonna stop anyway. So it doesn't really matter if this stops. So your actuator is gonna come with two wires, a positive and a negative. Now, depending on which actuator you buy, the colors could change, but mine has brown and blue. Brown being the hot wire with a positive and blue being the negative wire. Most of these switches are gonna have six terminals on the back. Now, it's hard to see with the wires pre-attached because they come this way, but you can buy switches that don't have wires on them. But the middle two terminals are gonna be for your actual actuator. And then diagonally from each other, the top and bottom opposites diagonally, one's gonna be positive, one negative. So when you wire it in, keep that in mind. Moving on to the battery. Now this is just a regular 12 volt battery. This is often used in smaller cars and bigger tractors. It does have the round terminals. So I am gonna need a way to convert from the round to my electrical connectors going to the switch. What I'm gonna do is use these quick connect switches. That's gonna enable me to quickly go from this to the, to the electrical connectors and also turn it off and on when I want to. So this battery is actually refurbished. So it was about $60, which isn't bad. I thought about going with a deep cycle battery because it would be better. But at the end of the day, I'm gonna be splitting usually at my house. So I could run a trickle charger or something out to this battery. And I plan to charge it after each splitting session when I bring it back into the barn here. So a deep cycle battery would work better, but it's also like double the cost of this battery. They don't have refurbished deep cycle batteries to the place I went, which is a battery specialty place. Um, so like I said, it was about double the cost for a deep cycle. So I decided to go with this route. I think it'll work out. If it doesn't, then we'll go with a deep cycle battery route, but hopefully it works. So while the paint's drying, let's wire in some of the stuff.
guys think? I think it worked pretty good. Did notice a difference in speed. At least it seemed slower than when it was empty, which makes sense. They claim that it's the same speed, whether it's loaded or empty, but it seemed slower to me. Let me know what you guys think. But either way, that was a big piece of wood. You saw me measure it. That All that wood you see right here is from that one round. That was easily 300 pounds. I'm going to say probably close to 350. There was a couple things I want to still do. I can foresee a lot of junk falling on top of that battery. So I'm going to make some kind of cover to cover that. I think what I'm going to do to make it easy on myself, I'm going to take these two bolts out. I'm going to make them longer. And then I'm going to get a flat piece of steel. So I still got space in between. And it's going to keep all the stuff from falling in there. It's just, you know, there'll be an inch gap or whatever to the steel. And then I can just brush that off and I'll take care of that. And then I'm going to put some wire loom on these wires just to keep them a little more protected. One last thing I do want to mention is the linear actuators do have what they call a duty cycle. So basically what that means is it's a percentage of how long it can run versus how long it has to rest so it doesn't overheat. Um, you know, they can come 20%, 30%, 40%. This one's a little better, it's 30%. So I believe that means for every you know minute it works, it has to rest roughly three minutes. So if it takes a full, you know, let's say 30 seconds to uh, lift it up, you need to let it rest for a minute and a half. I believe that's the correct math. Let me know if I'm wrong, but which is going to be fine because to split up a big round like that, it's going to take you a couple of minutes and you can find other stuff to do. If you get it done quicker, you can go get some other rounds ready. Last thing I do want to mention and touch on is, in my opinion, these drop down legs are kind of crucial. And the reason for that is, Super splits are not a very big machine. I think they only weigh around maybe 400 pounds. Obviously, mine has been modified and it's a little heavier. But a stock, stock super split really isn't that heavy. You've got the one leg right below the beam with the foot and then two tires. So you've got three contact points. So I have a feeling if I didn't have these drop down legs to add two more, you know, kind of stabilizing points. I think with a big round like that, you could possibly tip this machine over or do damage to it. So... I'm going to say if anyone does a mod like this on their super split, I would definitely try to factor in a way to have additional drop down stabilizing legs or outriggers like, you know, kind of like backhoes have or cranes or anything like that. Because I think that would be really important because once you get out, you know, it's about from the pivot point to that corner is about three feet. So you're three feet out with, you know, let's say 300 pounds. That's a lot of additional stress. So my machine handled it okay because of the outriggers, but I don't know if it would have if it weren't for those additional drop-down legs I have.